the music has stopped, Martin. I think we can yeah, start maybe. Uh, great, <laughs> but I see also that the number of attendances is, is still going up very rapidly. Right. So maybe we should wait just 60 seconds. All right. Okay, good. So, welcome back everybody to the plenary sessions of Taub. In today's first plenary session, we will talk about double beta decay. We have two talks, one from more theory perspective and the second more from the experimental side. We'll start with the theory perspective. Uh, Frank, if you could share the screen and whenever you're ready, you can start. Um, okay, yeah. Let's make this full screen. You can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Everything seems to be working. Yeah, all right. Um, okay, yeah. thank you very much, Martin, for the introduction um, and for the organizer uh, for, for inviting me. Um, as everyone said, I would have rather joined in Valencia, but at least I have two cats here as audience, so this is also not, not, not the worst thing to do, <laughs> talk like that. So as Martin was saying, I will give a review on double beta decay. Uh, from a theory perspective, um, with a kind of experimental perspective following afterwards. Um, so many of the things you will have heard, of course, right? So neutrino star beta decay is a lepton molating process and kind of probes uh, the Majorana nature of neutrinos. So essentially is trying to answer, so to say, the kind of crucial question uh, we have about neutrinos, which for example, uh, Ray was, was mentioning yesterday in terms of neutrino mass models, for example, right? Whether neutrinos are Majorana or Dira particles, which is something which is yet unresolved, right? Which is kind of opens up two kind of pathways as going from the standard model, right? So it's one of the un kind of um, unanswered questions we have in particle physics, uh, which might be connected to other questions like dark matter and so on as well, right? But I will mostly kind of focus on this kind of specific issue and how it can be resolved with uh, neutrino style beta decay. Um, now, as a uh, as part of this, and just want to highlight this also briefly, is this issue of uh, kind of lepton number being broken, right? So this kind of uh, consequence that if neutrinos are Majorana particles, that we have uh, the lepton number symmetry needs to be broken, it needs to be violated by two units um, in order to create this Majorana mass term, right? Which, which gives neutrinos this character, right? Um, and this is a kind of in the standard model, it arises, so to say, this kind of global symmetry, this lepton number symmetry accidentally, right? Just by the, by, the, by, the, by the gauge symmetries and by the particle content we have in the standard model, it's not going to be put in by hand. So it might be connected to the mass generation, of course, right? That it's kind of accidentally broken, right? And the question, or the, sorry, accidentally um, 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 conserved, right? And the question might be, how could it be broken beyond the standard model, for example, right? We also know that it's broken on perturbatively, but B minus L is conserved, which for example, makes also a connection to the matter antimatter asymmetry in this context, right? For example, like leptogenesis could be one of the mechanisms. And again, all of this kind of is underlying the lepton number uh, violation of some kind of new physics scenario, which could then generate leptogenesis, but also neutrino masses, for example, right? One can even go deeper in a sense that there's the idea that global symmetry is such, such this one, right? Which apparently is there in the standard model. It's expected to be broken gravitational effect. So one can in some sense write down a neutrino mass from the Planck scale, if you want, right? Which gives you something of the order 10 to minus five, right? Um, but in a way, this doesn't really work. It's 10 kind of close, right? But it's too small to explain the oscillations, for example, right? Or the kind of order of oscillations we see, but it's also too large as a subdominant splitting, right? Because this 10 to minus five EV, for example, as a mass splitting would have shown up in oscillations, for example, right? And so of course, now the question we have is now, can we, how can we resolve this? Uh, at neutrino style beta decay is of course the kind of universal tool to look for lepton number violation and specifically for the for, for light Moirana neutrinos. And it's part of the family of beta decays, right? Which are of course very important for neutrino physics, like single beta decay, which is still being used, of course, to kind of crucial. And we have heard uh, in the previous kind of uh, um, parallel sessions 
um, that this allows for kinematic measurement, specifically in tritium of the neutrino mass, right? What I'm talking about here is now second order effect, right? Instead of having one beta decay, so to say they have two beta decays happening at the same time. Uh, this is the so-called allowed double beta decay, which is allowed in the standard model, right? It doesn't depend on the nature of the neutrinos. So it's, we have been measuring this already, right? Um, from the new physics perspective, right? What we're interested in mostly, of course, which is kind of the bread and butter physics of what we're talking about here, is neutrino less double beta decay, right? So the idea that if neutrinos are their own antiparticles, uh, it's not that we have two neutrinos being emitted from the decay, right? But they're kind of kind of exchange between one beta decay to the other one, right? Which is only possible if neutrinos have a mass, which leads to some kind of helicity flip in the process, right? But it's also only possible if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, right? Otherwise, we can't have this kind of um, um, kind of propagator of this form here, right? So, if you want to take one thing away, of course, is that neutrino star beta decay is the process which proves that lepton number is broken, right? Because we just see two electrons being emitted without any missing energy, right? Um, it would be mediated by light Majorana neutrinos. Right, which we expect to maybe expect to have in the standard model or going beyond the standard model. And that is what I'm going to mostly focus on. There are alternatives, right, that you also could kind of emit positrons or you could capture an electron from the shell and so on. But most sensitive scenario is essentially this kind of um, um, uh, beta decay, double beta decay, where two electrons are being emitted. Okay. Now, if you want to calculate this from the standard, from the from the particle physics point of view, the diagram you can see here above, right? You have an exchange of a light neutrino, which has some kind of a momentum exchange of all 100 uh, mega electron volt, which is set by the scale of nuclear physics, essentially, right? And if you calculate this as to, in terms of the amplitude, then you will see that you essentially get uh, kind of dependent on this effective double beta decay mass, which because we have in the case that we have three light neutrinos, uh, gives contributions from all three light neutrinos, right? And because of the mixing, you have the PMS ma uh, mixing matrix appearing here, uh, but it appears squared because of the lepton number valent nature, essentially, uh, not absolute squared, right? This leads to the consequence that we have this Majorana phases coming in and entering the dependence, right? Um, from the kind of atomic physics part, we also have to kind of calculate the atomic phase space, which comes out of it, right? We have two electrons kind of kind of being emitted and going through the kind of atomic shell, for example, right? And being affected by the positive charge of the remaining nucleus, of course, right? And you get essentially dependence on this phase space to the so-called um, Q value, right? Which is the kinematic kind of energy release uh, to the fifth power here, right? And the most difficult part in all the kind of theoretical calculations um, is the nuclear part because it's a nuclear decay, it's a nuclear process, and we need to calculate this and the kind of isotopes, the elements considered for, for in, in which this decay is possible, um, they are quite heavy, right? So it's a many body problem and it's difficult to calculate. But if we estimate them there of the order one, we get this typical dependence, which is of course the practical reason why we search for double beta decay in a sense that we get half-lives of double beta decay, neutrino lives double beta decay um, of order 10 to 25 years. If this effective mass, if the light neutrinos are of order of the electron volt scale, right? And this is something the experiments will do. And this you will hear in more detail in the, in the, next, in the next talk, okay? And again, just to mention that um, in order for this double beta decay to observe, to be observable, right? We have, this doesn't work in all isotopes, but we have to look at isotopes where single beta decay is energetically forbidden, right? Uh, and in such a case, two neutrino double beta decay will always occur, right? And if neutrinos are Majorana, the neutrino is double beta decay will also occur. Um, so this kind of diagram, I'm pretty sure you've seen many, many times. So it's the lightest neutrino mass versus this effective double beta decay mass in neutrino double beta decay, right? Uh, it's explicitly written up here as a combination. And again, just to highlight what appears here are these Majorana phases, um, uh, which, which are irreducible, okay, because of the lepton number relating nature of the process. Um, and they appear um, because of, uh, um, uh, in the case that neutrinos are Majorana, um, we, cannot, we cannot rotate them away, right? In the case of Dirac, they don't appear, but here we have them, okay? And this gives you essentially this uncertainty, this kind of band-like structure here, 
in this kind of relation, right? And also the kind of difference between inverse hierarchy and normal ordered hierarchy, right? Um, which is being probed, right? Um, and of course, what you can see in the normally, normal ordered case, and we have kind of from oscillations to kind of hint that this might be true, right? We always have this kind of issue that this effective double beta decay mass could go to zero, right? So, so even though neutrinos are Majorana, this effective double beta decay mass could effectively be in LPB zero, okay? Which of course might be a problem, right? If you want to observe neutrinos double beta decay. Now in terms of the sensitivity, I show a similar plot. Uh, again, M beta beta on the left hand on the, on the vertical axis. And now on the, on, the, on the horizontal axis, I show the so-called cosmological sigma, which is the sum of neutrino masses, right? Which is kind of a similar kind of relation. And also what has changed here, um, this is all linear, right? So you can see here the normal ordered case here, uh, this kind of funnel region, this where all of the contributions cancel, actually appears only at this bottom kind of part here, right? Um, so this is actually not something which is being probed by experiments, so to say, right? Um, but importantly, you can kind of see the relation between, between neutrinos down beta decay limits, okay? One example shown here above, uh, with uncertainty of the nuclear matrix elements, right? So this is supposed to be as a kind of band, right? But it extends to the upper corner, so to say, or to the, to the upper edge, right? And then with cosmological limits, okay? And the only thing I want to highlight, so to say, is that if you look at the future sensitivities, which kind of aim to go beyond or below the inverse hierarchy scenario, right? And the future sensitivity of cosmological surveys in kind of measuring this sum of neutrino masses, and future surveys aim to kind of actually measure it instead of just putting a limit on it. Um, even if the lightest neutrino is perfectly massless, right? We get essentially in the future, so to say, what we're kind of probing is this kind of box here, right? And even in the normal order case, you can see, you see still see a sizable kind of chunk which is, which is being probed by neutrino star beta decay. Although I must say, as a new physics uh, kind of PSM physicist, it would actually be most, most interesting if we were to make a measurement in this kind of white space, right? Because this would be an area which is not consistent just with the light neutrino exchange, right? So in the white kind of area, you would need some, need some kind of physics which goes beyond the light neutrino masses, okay? Um, now, as I mentioned, this issue about uh, the, the M beta beta is a kind of practical issue in terms of you want to kind of, kind of design future experiments. So to say, what is, should be the goal of future experiments in a way, right? Of course, the goal should be to be <laughs> as sensitive as possible, right? But if M beta beta really can become zero, then what, what theoretically where should we aim for? And the question is difficult to answer, right? There are essentially kind of two approaches what you could think of. Uh, one is that M beta beta, the cancellation of which is in some sense accidental, right? If you imagine that the phases have random values, um, this kind of cancellation only happens if the two phases, the Majorana phases, um, kind of conspire against each other uh, to make M beta beta zero, right? And from this point of view, it's kind of unlikely, right? So you can make a kind of Monte Carlo kind of game, so to say, um, and kind of just randomly vary them, right? Which gives you an effective kind of lower limit, so to say, if you want M beta beta, right? Which then also allows you, so to say, to kind of make kind of future predictions or kind of discovery probability based on, based on current kind of data, right? And the future sensitivities, right? Um, although this depends, of course, we don't know what the phases are, right? This just assumes they're kind of randomly distributed on a kind of linear scale, if you want, right? Uh, which is not something we can answer, right? Uh, from a theoretical point of view, you could also think about enhancing your symmetries. You can involve flavor symmetries or generalized CP symmetries. For example, what is plotted here is modular invariance, which was proposed by, by uh, Foruglio, right? Um, and what happens in such cases is such that you have a prediction for M beta beta. And in this model, for example, it appears that the predicted values lie at the kind of upper edge, right? They might, many of them, or some of them might be already excluded now, for example, from cosmological surveys, right? Um, but they predict kind of values which do not go into this funnel region, right? But again, this is just one example of a theory, right? Um, there's kind of many, many out there uh, from the flavor kind of uh, theory kind of point of view, right? Which make different predictions, right? So this is not always, this is not as universal. Okay, now one issue, as I already mentioned, are the nuclear matrix elements. So in order to make a theoretical prediction for neutrino star beta decay, 
right? And then compare to experiments, we want to extract M beta beta. And specifically what we need for that is to, to know what the nuclear matrix elements are, right? And these are very difficult to calculate from the nuclear physics point of view. And uh, still we have in some sense a factor of two and three uncertainty between different nuclear models, right? So it's been shown here in a kind of, um, kind of upcoming kind of uh, summary of all the kind of nuclear matrix elements in the different isotopes, which are relevant for double beta decay. And as you can see here, you can see a kind of large variation, okay? And what I'm gonna mention later on is what, what is coming up now uh, is a kind of new approach, so-called up initio nuclear matrix elements, which, which are being calculated uh, without so 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 called phenomenological approximations to to the to the nuclear system in a way, right? Um, they also start to calculate enemies, and they tend, unfortunately, for the lighter isotopes, they, they tend to be smaller here. So these are the green kind of bands here, right? Compared to the rest of the kind of um, what what I call phenomenological enemies. Okay, so this will be an issue which in the intermediate kind of term probably needs to be resolved and needs to be understood. Okay. Another issue might be so-called quenching. Um, the axial coupling, which appears in the nuclear matrix elements, uh, appears with a squared value, right? So the, the rate of double beta decay depends on it to the fourth power, approximately, right? It's not, there's only, not all contributions will depend on it, right? And uh, for example, all in single beta decay and two neutrino double beta decay, we already know because they have been measured experimentally um, that in order to compare the rate with, a, with, the, with the theoretic prediction, it seems to be that GA is smaller than expected, right? Uh, the neutron value, so for an isolated nucleon, right? The value is 1.27 something, right? Um, but in a uh, nucleus, it seems to be effectively smaller, okay? Um, so there could be several answers for this, right? There could be a restricted model space, so your nuclear model is not precise enough. Uh, there could be missing effects from two body currents. Um, this also seems to be starting to be resolved using up initial met methods, uh, but specifically in single beta decay. So single beta decay, this has been an issue for, for really many, many years, right? But recently this has been kind of resolved in a calculation where in an up initio model, you can calculate single beta decay and you get the pre predicted value or the you can predict the experimental values um, uh, without any need of kind of quenching, okay? And this is hopefully kind of being applied for neutrino star beta decay as well, right? So there's an ongoing effort to combine essentially current effective field theory as a kind of low energy theory of, 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 of hadrons in a way, right? With input from lattice, right? And then also ab initio many body, body methods uh, from the nuclear point of view uh, to essentially calculate and kind of also estimate the errors of the enemies and <laughs> nuclear matrix elements much more precisely, okay? Experiment can also play a role because there are some kind of uh, observables like uh, charge exchange reactions at the proposed Newman um, experiment, for example, right? Um, for example, also muon decay or muon capture rather, sorry, um, which can probe some parts of the nuclear uh, matrix element space if you want. Okay, but so going back uh, to, to particle physics, maybe I need to speed up a little bit. Um, there are of course many, many other things we can test, right? I mentioned that uh, neutrino star beta decay is essentially a kind of universal probe of lepton number violation. And it's not just light neutrinos which can mediate lepton number violation, but you could have, for example, heavy physics, okay? Uh, the most prominent example is likely to be that we have a sterile neutrino, a heavy sterile neutrino. It could be light also. If it's lighter than 100 MeV, it's kind of considered light as far as neutrinos star beta decay is concerned. And we would just add it, so to say, to M beta beta if you want, okay? If it's much heavier than 100 MeV, it also contributes, but the dependence will be different, right? And the kind of summary you would get here is this, or this kind of form, and you can kind of compare it. So to say the kind of limits you get from neutrinos star beta decay, shown here in blue, right? And compare it with direct searches, for example, at colliders, um, um, at kind of uh, long-lived kind of facilities, like the ship experiment for the proposed ship experiment, for example, or single beta decay direct mass measurements, for example, here, right? Which can also probe uh, sterile neutrinos, okay? Um, although you have to be careful, right? So this kind of limit assumes the sterile neutrino is perfectly Majorana, right? Which would actually mean via the CISO mechanism, it would make the light neutrinos actually too heavy, right? So it actually does not work. 
Okay, so specifically one then consider some kind of um, uh, approximate let the number conservation such that the steroneutrino becomes quasi Dirac, right? Which effectively means there's a kind of you have two steroneutrinos if you want, which have a small mass building in a way, right? And this essentially reduces the sensitivity of neutrinos dial beta decay, right? So you can see the change or the kind of sensitivity of dial beta decay is between the case that they're perfectly Mirana, right? Or they're quasi Dirac to the level that there is a splitting of order 10 to minus four, right? A quasi kind of uh, lepton number conservation to the order of 10 to minus four in this kind of sector. And this is in some sense, just one example, right? There are many, many models out there as long, in some sense, as long as there's lepton number violation, you can imagine you get my rhino neutrinos out of it, right? Typically we construct models such that we get light my rhino neutrinos out of these, right? And in many models you then also get extra contributions to neutrinos that are better decay, like left-right symmetry or parity violation, extra dimensions, which could kind of produce towers of particles uh, kind of being mediated here, leptoquarks, which of course might be interested for the anomalies we are seeing, right? Five, five minutes. Yeah, okay. And uh, the important point to make here is that in these cases, neutrinos would still be my Rana fermions. Uh, via this Schechter Valley kind of theorem or kind of black box kind of diagram here, that no matter what mediates double beta decay, neutrinos would be would would acquire a Majorana neutrino mass, right? Which would then mean they would be Majorana fermions. Okay, so we can organize this again as Ray, for example, was talking about yesterday in terms of neutrino mass operators. They are likewise operators for neutrino star beta decay. If everything is heavy, they are short range nine dimensional operators. If there's a light mediator, they're seven dimensional. And what we're essentially probing here is the physics at around the TV scale, one to 10 TV or something like this, right? Um, of the new physics inside of this operator, right? For example, a right-handed W boson, for example, of the order of a few TV, for example, okay? And one can do this kind of effectively, right? If one uh, writes down all effective operators, right? They have different structures from the Lorentz structure. Um, right, and then you can put limits from current experiments, right, shown here with this kind of black, uh, dark kind of bars here, right, um, compared to future experiments. And as you can see here, right, the limits of all the few TV, and in the in very far future, they will go up to 18 TV or so, right. In some of the operators, specifically those where you so called, where you get a so called enhancement via, via pion mediated contributions, okay. Um, uh, I think I will probably, I have well, four minutes I can see, right? That's correct. Yes, please. Um, well, one thing I want to mention is that um, one can do these operators, so to say, by one by one, right? So they probe the scale of around one TV to 10 TV or so. Um, but what is also maybe important and this, again, one simple kind of example to say why it's useful to have multi-isotope measurements is that, um, what we expect is that these contributions can actually interfere with each other. And specifically what is most important, what's most interesting, I think, right, is that you have some kind of exotic contribution, epsilon times its matrix element, which is different, um, interfering together with the standard mass mechanism, right? Uh, the standard mass um, NME M nu here, right? And then the con contribution from the light neutrino exchange, right? And they can interfere with each other. So this means we actually, Strictly speaking, we cannot measure them in, in independently, right? So instead of measuring M beta beta, you're actually measuring this combination here, right? And a limit of the order 10 to 26 in germanium, for example, would essentially put a kind of limit on this parameter space. So this epsilon, this effective kind of operator coupling, if you want, right? It's the Wilson coefficient of this operator, right? And M beta beta is going to be constrained in this kind of, in this kind of colored band here, right? And then you can play the kind of game if you were to measure something, um, if you were to measure neutrino star beta decay in multiple isotopes, you get more information, right? So this shows the same picture, M beta beta on the horizontal axis, epsilon on the, on the vertical one, right? And if you put in the kind of true values, right? What we put in here is 30 milli electron volt for um, um, M beta beta and epsilon set to zero. Again, measuring it one isotope, it should, you just see something along the band. If you were to measure two isotopes, you get already a kind of a restriction here, 
but xenon and germanium in this instance, they're kind of similar, which means the matrix elements are similar. So this relation is similar, right? Whereas for example, if you add molybdenum, right? Then the kind of dependence or the kind of um, um, reduction of the parameter space is much more severe, right? So if you were to measure in all three isotopes, you get a much more kind of uh, uh, reduced parameter space and a better measurement of your, of your parameters, okay? So I'm quickly running out of time. The very few things, I don't have time for this, but just flash it here, right? What I did not really talk about in detail is what you can also have is exotic particle emission, right? So what is of course has been studied many, many times is you can emit a so-called myron, which is kind of a particle which couples to the neutrinos, right? And because of the energies involved, this myron needs to be of order MeV or so, right? Mega electron volt, right? That's what it, that's kind of scale you're probing here, right? Um, this has been extended. You can emit two myrons, for example. What we looked at is, for example, left-right symmetric model, right? Where you emit a, again, a light scalar here from an effective operator, okay? And the only thing I think you should take away from this here, in such scenarios, lepton number does not necess necessarily need to be violated. So neutrinos can actually be Dirac in such scenarios because we have missing energy by the scalar being emitted here, okay? And then the very last thing in my last slide I'm showing, again, also just very flashing because um, as neutrino star beta decay experiments become more and more sensitive, they also measure two neutrino, the two neutrino double beta decay, decay spectrum much more precisely. So actually you might think of kind of the, uh, looking for new physics in the two neutrino double beta spectrum also, right? So this call, for example, includes that you can search for right-handed currents in the two neutrino double beta decay spectrum. Um, you can search for neutrino self interactions. In all of these processes, you have two neutrinos being emitted, right? But these are kind of exotic contributions to this channel, right? Um, you can uh, you search for neutrino self interactions. And for example, you can also even search for sterile neutrinos uh, using the endpoint in two neutrino double beta decay, right? So it's not sterile neutrinos being mediated in neutrinos double beta decay, but a sterile neutrino being emitted as part of two neutrino double beta decay. And via its endpoint, you can infer the mass. The sensitivity is not very high, right? But it can, in some, in some cases, improve uh, upon what is currently being set specifically in uh, in single beta decay in this in this kind of mass region. And I think because I'm running out of time here, I think it's best I leave my conclusions here. Um, and I thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for this very nice overview, which I enjoyed very much. We have just time for one or two short questions. If you have any questions, please use uh, the chat to write a question. Right now, I don't see any questions, so I have one myself. When, when, you, when you try to disentangle two or more different contributions, yeah, that one, uh, does, this, does this take into account the uncertainty of the matrix element? Uh, this plot not yet yes that is correct <laughs> but in principle i mean in principle of course it does also right i mean the uncertainties become larger right i mean our our goal in some sense will be to kind of understand what what can be what, what can be done in the future right and i was promising in my in my conclusion slide is that these ab initio methods promise to get a better understanding of the enemies right so in the future it is hopeful that we get a reduction of the enemy uncertainties in some way, right? Uh, yeah. But the principle, the principle applies, right? It's yeah, just yes, that yes, yes, the error bands will be different. Yes, of course. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I actually see no other questions. Seems everything was very clear. Thank you very much again, Frank. And uh, we will switch to the experimental aspects of double beta decay now. Um, Andrea, uh, Frank, can you stop sharing, please? Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrea, yeah. So Andrea Giuliani will now make us an overview on the experimental aspects of double beta decay. Andrea, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Please share okay, the very, screen. Very good. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I will start share again. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Now I can see your screen. Thanks. Please go ahead. Okay. 
Okay, first of all, thank, I, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, to give this uh, review of double DPDK experiments. And uh, this is a short introduction to neutrino as double beta decay in a nutshell. I will be very fast because I had a perfect introduction by Frank just before. Uh, let me just remind you that neutrino as double beta decay is a process in which a nucleus transforms into an isobar with two more protons and two electrons and nothing else. So creation of matter without antimatter partners, of course, beyond standard model. It has never been observed experimentally the best limits are half-life of the order of 10 to 24, 20 to, 10 to 20 to 26 years, depending on the nucleus. And we have, uh, as we heard, a sort of standard mechanism related to neutrino physics, in which neutrino as double beta decay is mediated by light, max massive Majorana neutrinos, exactly those which oscillate, but also a lot of non-standard mechanisms that has been uh, revised before. It is the only currently viable experimental approach to probe the Majorana nature of neutrinos. So the experiments measure, constrain, or measure in, in, the, in the good case, and in general, constrain the half-life. Uh, assuming mass mechanism, this translates into information on the effective Majorana mass and beta beta, as we have seen. So we can use this classical plot in which M beta beta is plotted against the lightest neutrino mass. And experiments will explore this plot from above, uh, we have to, to say that uh, today, uh, a part of, part of this plot are, are a little bit, uh, let's say, excluded or, or made less favorable from other, other uh, experiments. For example, the normal order is preferred by neutrino oscillation experiments, and cosmology constrains the sum of the neutrino mass. So we are lived with this part that you can see here. It's very interesting that there is a window here where it is still possible to measure uh, to have a, a, a rather high value of M, M beta beta, even in case of normal ordering around, uh, around uh, 10 to uh, 20 million electrons. Uh, so let's, let's come now to the experimental aspects. So which signature and which nuclei? Uh, um, the experiments measure the sum energy spectrum of the two electrons. And the signal is just a peak at the Q value of the decay, enlarged only by the detector energy resolution. Uh, of course, we have the two neutrino double beta decay allowed by the standard model that produces a continuum with a maximum of about one third the Q, and then can leak if the energy resolution of the detector is not good enough in the region of neutrino less double beta. So the signal is, is a peak and it is normally, it grows this peak normally over a flat background. The process is possible for 35 nuclei, but only nine of them are really experimentally relevant because of the high Q beta beta around two, three MeV for the most promising candidates. You can see here in red, the nine interesting candidate, six of them have a Q beta beta that it is higher than the endpoint of the natural gamma radioactivity and the, three of them are even free from the radon-induced radioactivity. However, the best results up to now have been obtained with nuclei which are below these two endpoints, and the reason is that these nuclei can be uh, matched very well with very powerful experimental techniques. In the future, we expect to have best results from these nuclei, once again, plus uh, molybdenum 100, which is also very broad. So which half-lives, I will be very fast in this slide because uh, Frank has already introduced all the topic here. Let me just say that in case of no quenching of GA, uh, we can use this working formula for the general experimental design in which the, the, the half-life on neutrino as double beta decay is given by 10 to 27, 10 to 28 years for an effective Majorana mass of the order of 10 milli electron volts. Uh, if we take uh, this, uh, this formula and we take, for example, uh, the, the less favorable nuclear matrix elements for molybdenum, which is a little bit uh, in, in, in an average position as far as the rate of neutrino as double beta decay is concerned, we see that the, the, the current searches correspond to about 170 counts per ton per 10 year. And this is where we are for the, in terms of, uh, of uh, experimental sensitivity. And in the future, if we want to skewed the completely, completely the inverted higher P region, we must become uh, sensitive to about 20 counts per ton per 10 year, corresponding to half-life of the order of 10 to 27, more than 10 to 27 here. And this is the reach of next generation search. 
That means that we need, of course, Tom scale to have enough counts, uh, 10 year duration to have uh, once again enough counts, and zero background. Zero background is very important because the sensitivity scales in case of zero background and the source mass times the measurement time. And so this is the best way to exploit completely the, the, the source mass uh, that, that we are using in our in our detector. So a general aim of next generation experiment is to reduce the ground almost to zero. For the moment, we have only one example of an experiment that is, has, really, has really been running in the zero background mode, uh, that is GERDA. And so in GERDA, we can very nicely see the linear dependence of the limit on the exposure from 2013 to, to 2010. This is a little bit the target of, of any other experiment. In the uh, so, of course, in order to, to, to uh, design next generation experiment, we have to expand the source and to abate the background. So, once again, we need Tom scale source more than 10 to 27 nuclei. We need isotopic enrichment. So, the isotopic abundance is artificially increased to more than 80%. Uh, there is the important case of tellurium 130 that is an isotopic abundance of 34%, which is an outlier. Uh, among double beta decay candidates. And this makes possible to have sensitive searches also with natural tellurium. This is very important also for future projects. And of course, it's very important to maximize the efficiency. And in order to do that, it's important that the source is included within the detector. And the option in which the source is separated from the detector, that it is very convenient if you want to have access to additional parameters in the decay is abandoned for next generation experiments just because the efficiency would be too low to be compared. As for the background, of course, we have to take a standard common actions common to all the experiment. So to control the nature of radioactivity, so the radiopurity of materials, to exclude the cosmic muons going underground and, and also neutrons for which the quality and the depth of the underground laboratory is very important and the dedicated shielding are often required. And then, of course, we have to control the cosmogenic induced activity. Then there are specific actions that depend on the technology. For example, for example, high energy resolution, that of course means low background because we reduce the window uh, over which in which we look for the decay, particle identification, tracking or event topology, multi-site versus single-site events, surface versus bulk events, fiducia volume, active shielding, a final state nucleus identification. All these tools can be used, sometimes are used simultaneously in the same experiment. Most of the, in most of the cases, they characterize the particular experiments and technologies. Uh, it makes sense sometimes to define a sort of background index, the number of background counts in the region of interest for unit of detector mass, unit of energy, and unit of measuring. So there are two main approaches uh, in uh, neutrino as double beta decay experiments. There are experiments in which the source is embedded in a fluid. In this case, large source mass are easily possible and the experiment is easily, easily scalable. For example, one can increase the size of the vessel or increase the source concentration. But uh, as a drawback, uh, usually the energy resolution is not so good. Um, the other possibility is to uh, have a, a, a source embedded in crystals. In this case, it's more difficult to get high detector mass, but it's easier to get high energy resolution and efficiency. And uh, the, the, the typical way to increase the mass, so to, 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 to get scalability, is just to multiply the number of crystals in this case. So uh, the experimentalists uh, have deployed an arsenal of technology to detect uh, neutrino as double beta decay. Uh, for example, if you look at the fluid embedded source, uh, uh, a first method is to have the source dilute, diluted in a, a large reservoir of liquid scintillator, exploiting existing infrastructures, like in the case of Snow Plus without an inner balloon, or the case of Kamlan Zen with, with, with an inner balloon in which the source is contained. Another possibility is to, uh, is to um, develop TPCs, typically xenon TPCs, for example, high pressure gas with xenon cylindrical TPCs, which is the next way. And then liquid xenon TPC, like, the, like XO200 or NEXO, 
Uh, there are also more exotical approach like spherical PPC or exotical gas like uh, selenium hexafluoride. Uh, it is also possible to use double phase xenon uh, used in the Darmac Darmacter experiment like Darwin and uh, LZ and to use this to, to search for neutrino as double detector. In case of crystal embedded source, we can use inorganic scintillators, but this is not very powerful. It's much better to go to semiconductor detectors, for example, germanium diodes that can be immersed in liquid argon like in GERD and Legend, or can be hosted by conventional cryos that like the Majorana demonstrator. Even in this case, there are other possibilities or bolometers in which we can use pure bolometers like Quore or scintillating bolometers like in Cupid or Amore or assisted pulse-shape discrimination bolometers in the future like Cross. So if we want now to make a list of the experiments, including the one that are at the R&D level, we see that really we have a lot of different, uh, of different approaches uh, of different projects. Of course, I cannot go through all these projects. You, I, 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 I did the, the, the list, I hope not to have uh, forgot, forgotten something. Uh, here I will use a color code that I will use in the following. So in red is completed experiment, in green uh, data taking, in blue construction commissioning, in bold black uh, advanced R&D, sometimes at the CDR, TDR level, and in simple black the uh, R&D. I would, I would like to mention also that there are still experiments which use the source from different detector, for example, the Super Nemo demonstrator. Uh, now I will, uh, I will revise the current situation. There is a restricted club of experiment that has established limit uh, on the half-life higher than 10 to 24 years. I've listed here these experiments. Uh, in terms of half-life limit, Gerda is uh, leading with a, a limit of 1.8 times, times 10 to 26 uh, years. And uh, then there are uh, uh, many other experiments in this list. Uh, some of them uh, use the fluid embedded source uh, approach, like Kamlan and Exo 200, and others the crystal embedded source. And uh, there is still one experiment in this club that used the source uh, uh, separated from the detector, and it is, this is Nemo 3. It's interesting to see uh, how this translates in corresponding limit, limit ranges, depending, of course, on the nuclear matrix element of M beta beta. So we see that in this case, Kamlan then is leading uh, in spite of a lower uh, half-life limit because, uh, of course, xenon is a little bit better than germanium that has a low phase space due to the, due to the low Q value. And then there are all the other projects. Let me just um, underline that the results obtained from, from, by Kupi Molibdenum in some way also from Kupi Zero is remarkable if we consider that the exposure is about two orders of magnitudes lower than in the most sensitive searches, and this is very promising for the future. So now uh, I will uh, start to revise, to, to, to review uh, next generation experiment and beyond, and I, I will focus on seven research lines and experiments. Four of them are fluid embedded and three are crystal embedded. So I will uh, uh, describe this, the, the, what I will call the Kamlan line, then the exo line, the next line, and the snow plus line for fluid embedded experiment. And then I will have the legend line, the Cupid line, the Diamore line for uh, experiments in which the source is embedded in, uh, in crystals. In my view, these experiments are in the best position for actual construction and data taking on a few year time scale uh, for next generation experiment, for technology maturity, solid collaboration, and funding prospects. So let's start with the Kamlan, the Kamlan uh, Zen line. As I say, the Kamlan Zen 400, that it is now concluded, is the leading experiment in terms of M beta beta. Um, that it is constrained at 60, 160 milli electron volt. The concept is that I have enriched xenon diluted the 3% in weight in liquid scintillator, exploiting the existing Lacamlan detector with the addition of a nylon balloon, as you can see here. And um, the, the experiment at single event position resolution, so with a vertex resolution of 15 centimeters, this is very important for the ground reduction. 
And uh, the main background source is two neutrino double beta decay, and uh, also the radioactivity in the inner balloon and cosmogenic. Um, the evolution of Kamalan Zen 400 is Kamalan, Kam Kamalan Zen uh, 800 that started in January 2019, and it is taking data now. The major new points with respect to Kamalan Zen 400 are more as an isotope, of course, 745 kilogram oxygen 136, a new balloon more radio pure and uh, a more sophisticated analysis tools that lead to the reduction of, uh, of the, for example, of the background due to uh, carbon 12 spallation. And the idea, the, the, the purpose is to improve uh, Kamlan Zen 400 results by a factor four in terms of half life in five years, going down to an M beta beta constraint at the level of 30, 80 milli electrons. Uh, unfortunately, there are no new results for this uh, TAUT conference from Kamlan Zen. So the results that I show here are still of TAUT 2019, but we are waiting for new results soon. Um, a possible follow-up of this line is Kamla 2 Zen, in which the, the, the total mass of the isotope can be increased to one ton. And uh, several measures are taken in order to make the, 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 the total light emission higher by a factor five in order to have a better energy resolution by a factor two that it is very important for the two neutrino background. Let's go now to the exoline, in particular to the NEXO project. The NEXO is built on the successful EXO 200 experiment. Uh, that has also provided historically the first observation of two neutrino double beta decay of xenon 136 um, with 150 kilogram of xenon 136. Um, the concept is a single phase enriched liquid xenon TPC uh, with, of course, measurement of both charge and scintillation and with a reasonable energy resolution of 0.8% sigma cubic beta. Uh, of course, in liquid, the tracking is not possible, but it's possible to perform single site and versus multi site separation, very important for background control. And uh, the major upgrades of NEXO with respect to EXO 200, of course, more isotope, five tons of xenon 136, improvement in light sensors, increased light collection, improvement in radio purity. And you can see here the scaling from uh, seven, uh, from uh, uh, 74 uh, kilogram fiducial mass to 3.2 ton, and the energy resolution is improved from 1.2% to 0.8%. The background is dominated by radon outgassing and intrinsic radioactivity, and the equivalent background in index that it is foreseen is below 10 to minus 4, 7 times 10 to minus 5 counts per unit of kilogram per year, and the 10 year sensitivity of this uh, project has now, has now been up upgraded to 1.2%. 35 10 to 28 years, corresponding to a limit of M beta beta of 5, 15 milli electron volts. A possibility offered by Xenon is the tagging of the, uh, of the daughter of the barium 136 daughter that it has been demonstrated by fluorescence in solid Xenon in the by the Nexo collaboration that will not be applied to Nexo, of course, but then can be used for next to next generation experiment in the future. Uh, let me just uh, add that double phase xenon, xenon TPC is mainly conceived for direct dark matter search detection. As I say, that can provide competitive results on neutrino double beta decay xenon 136, even with natural axiom. For example, with the BAT, with sensitivities that are about one to orders of magnitude lower than nexus than current nexus. For example, Darwin, LZ, or Panda X4. So the next line. Uh, so in the, in the in next, we also use a xenon TPC, but this is a gaseous TPC, high pressure 10, 15 bar enriched xenon TPC. Um, next, use uh, detects only light, so primary scintillation, and uh, uh, the, the uh, ionization is detected through electroluminescence. Um, the proof of concept have been achieved with the next white experiment started in 2016 in Camfranc. It is a five kilogram prototype that has shown a very good energy resolution, better than 1% full width of maximum in the region of, it, of interest, which is better than 25 keV full width of maximum, and event topological construction. 
the, 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 the upscaling of next y to is next 100, which is standard, of course, more isotope, about 100 kilogram of enriched xenon gas. 15 bar operation, it's practically the same structure technology of next white. And the projected background index is four times the 20, 10 to minus four counts per kilogram per year, with a sensitivity similar to the current sensitivity of Kamlan Zen. But the main goal is to prepare future stages of the next technology. For example, next high definition that should start in 2026. Uh, the idea is to have up to one ton of enriched xenon gas at 20 bar, and especially to use xenon helium mixture in order to, to get lower electron diffusion, a better definition of the tracks. This allows to improve, to even to, to improve further the background index and to uh, get a target sensitivity of two times 10 to 27 years. And uh, the, 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 an, an additional step is to add barium tagging to this, uh, let's say, next high definition like module. Uh, Bion tagging by single molecule fluorescence images had already been proved by the next collaboration. And, and there is an R&D to adapt this method to the next dry environment in order to get a background free experiment with sensitivity of the order of eight times 10 to 27. So let's come, come now to the snow plus line. Uh, is no plus, uh, the concept is to reuse the acrylic vessel, the FPM TRA and the electronics of the snow detector and snow lab with a new target, Five major minutes. of the lunium low yeah. the liquid scintillator, yes? Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Instead, uh, instead of uh, heavy water. Uh, so the idea is to have 1.3 tons of the 130 dissolving 3.9 tons of nature at the lunium in the scintillator. It is possible to do this with a specially developed organometallic complex. Uh, snow plus consists of three phases. One is a pure water phase that it is over. And the other one, the present one, is the liquid scintillator phase without tellurium. These two phases have been very helpful because they have allowed to measure the background level uh, without the tellurium inside and to show that it is low enough for neutrinoless double beta decay search. And now the tellurium phase will start from 2022. And the five-year sensitivity of this experiment is 1.9 times times 10 to 26 uh, years with a limit with a, a sensitivity to m beta beta of 30, 104 milli electron volts. Uh, of course, it's possible to foresee a follow-up. This is the snow plus phase two with 3% tellurium concentration to improve and improving transparency, improving light detectors in order to get a sensitivity of the order of 10 to 27. And uh, this limit on the uh, effective major animals. Um, I will skip this and I will come now to the legend line. Legend is based on the essentially on the Gerda technology, high purity naked germanium detectors immersed in instrumented liquid argon, very high energy resolution and pulse shape discrimination um, uh, with, together with anti-coincident with the uh, with argon active shield reduce a lot the background. So there is the record background index of five times 24 counts per kg per kilo per year. Uh, Legend 200 combines the best of Gerda and Majorana demonstrator, reusing the Gerda infrastructure in Grassasso, but with 200 kilogram of revenue instead of 35. And uh, the commissioning of the detector is starting. So the detector deployment will start in September 2021. And the data taking will start around the end of the year or beginning of 2022. Legend 200, we have a sensitivity of the order of 20, 10 to 27 years. And the follow up is Legend 1000. Same technology, a new larger infrastructure, of course, must be built. Uh, the idea is to have a phased approach up to one ton of uh, germanium 76. So the site is to be decided that the baseline is no lab. The sensitivity, the spectral sensitivity is very high, uh, m beta beta uh, of the order of 921 milli electron volt. Then we have the Cupid line. The Cupid line is, of course, based on the core experiment running in Gran Sasso with an exposure of one ton per year. This is a record for the bolometric experiment. Um, the concept is an array of natural tellurium oxide crystals operated as pure bolometers as 10 milli K. Um, the, 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 the issue in Quora is that it is dominated by energy, the background is dominated by energy degraded surface alphas. Uh, in spite of that, it is one of the most sensitive experiments presently running. 
And the target after high sensitivity is on the, on the order of 50, 130 million. It's very important now that a small experiment to be in France have shown that it's possible to upgrade the quarry with a new technology that use scintillating bolometers instead of pure bolometers so, so that it is possible to get rid of the alpha background. And the Tellurium 130 can be replaced by molybdenum 100 that has a Q value higher, higher than 2.6 MeV, so it is possible to reject external gamma background. The experiment is very small, but has provided the, the best results ever on molybdenum 100, and it is background, background free after light cut. A similar technology has been pre previously used by Cupid Zero in Gran Sasso with another compound, zinc selenide, that, however, is less uh, interesting than lithium molybdate because of the, uh, um, some internal radioactivity and, uh, and uh, uh, worse energy resolution. And this point, moment, every, everything is ready to build Cupid. The Cupid is built on the successful, successful Cupid Moe Quarry project. Cupid Pole provides the technology. Quarry provides, of course, uh, the infrastructures, but also the, the approach to the electronics and the, to, the, to the data analysis tools, and also the demonstration that on scale volumetric experiment is possible. Uh, Cupid will be an array of lithium molybdate crystals with 240 kilograms of molybdenum 100, and with volumetric germanium like detectors like Cupid molybdenum and Cupid. The sensitivity of Cupid is based on a data-driven background model with information coming from Cupid Molybden and Cupid Zero and on the core background model that I let me remark is developed inside the same infrastructure where Cupid will be housed. So it's really an in situ background model. The projected background index 10 to minus four counts per kV per kilogram per year. And the critical background com component is the random coincidence of two neutrino double beta decay. The sensitivity, the expected sensitivity in 10 years, discovery sensitivity is 12, 20 milli electron volt in a meter. There are possible follow up of Cupid, Cupid reach, same sensitive mass and cryostat as Cupid, but with background improvement by factor 10, going down to 8, 14 milli electron volt, or with a new cryostat, one ton of isotope with a background improvement by factor 20, going down to 4, 7 milli electron volt in terms of effective material. There is an intense, intense R&D to improve background in lithium molybdate and tellurium based volumetric experiments, for example, in cross to reject surface events by pal shape discrimination assisted by metal thin point co coating, and bingo with the addition of internal active shield, zinc tank state scintillators, enhanced sensitivity light detector, and revolutionary detector assembly for surface radioactivity reduction. This is my last experiment. This is the Amore line. Amore also used molybdenum 100 containing scintillating bolometers. Amore started with a different compound, cadmium calcium tungstate, uh, calcium molybdate, sorry, but then due essentially to a challenge in internal contamination, uh, the collaboration has decided to move, uh, practically to move to the same compound as stupid lithium molybdate. Um, Amore One is uh, taking data. It's a project that started in, in uh, was 2020 and we stopped in 2022. It contains uh, 13 crystals of, uh, uh, of calcium uh, molybdate and five crystals of lithium molybdate. And the projected sensitivity of Amore One is 130 to 150 milli electron volt. And Amore Two will be built starting from 2022 in a new cryostat, the new underground lab, uh, using secured 110 kilogram of molybdenum 100 with 600 crystal. Uh, the, the target background index is the same as Cupid, and the projected sensitivity is down to 1325 milli electron. So now I will conclude with the possible scenario in five years. So you can see here the experiments which are taking data or under commissioning or under preparation now that can attack and partially cover the inverted ordering region in the next five years. But in the next five years, we also will have the start of the real next generation project. Uh, you can have here a uh, uh, scheme of what to, we will have. Uh, we, we have advanced projects like Cupid, Amore 2, Legend 1000, Nexo, Snow no Plus Phase 2 that can really almost explore completely the inverted order region, and in some cases to go toward the normal order region. And then, of course, there are the follow up of this experiment that in some cases are reasonable, uh, take many years, of course, and we, we, be, we have to 
wait for the results of the precursors, but in some way it will be possible to approach uh, to the normal ordering. You can notice, for example, cupid one ton in this in this in this plot. So these are my conclusions. Neutrinoless double beta decay is a crucial process for particle physics cosmology. As you have seen, the field is extremely active, a variety of approaches and technologies. Many projects aim at extending the present sensitivity. Next generation experiments have a good discovery potential, but despite all that, that elusive peak still escapes detection. In some way, really, neutrino as double beta decay is the holy grail of neutrinos. Thank okay, you very much. This is my presentation. The Thank you very much for this really complete overview on the experimental situation. <clears throat> we went a little bit over time, but uh, I think there is time for one question or two, if there's any urgent question. Please use the chat for writing questions. I don't see any question. May I ask one myself? Yes. Um, the, the Qubit, you're saying this uh, will go on. Qubit is funded already? Uh, okay. Qubit oh, okay. is strongly supported by INFN and it is under the, the portfolio review from DOE in the United States. So we cannot say that the experiment is funding, but I would say that the funding prospects are good. And there are also some funding from France where the Qubit technology was developed. That are not at the level of the uh, of the uh, expected uh, uh, Italian and American funding, but that are in any case not negligible. Yeah, thank you very much. I see no other questions right now, so um, I would like to thank both of our speakers again for these really very inspiring talks. I thank everybody for the participation and a technical comment at the end. Uh, we will close this session. So for the next plenary, which starts at four o'clock, use the same link, but you will need to reconnect. So thank you very much and see you again in half an hour. Thanks a lot.